can we fix it? No, we can't fix it. We know that we're in a, a world of rising temperatures. The question is, how high, how high and how fast are they going to rise? It's going to, we're going to keep setting new records until we, uh, until we become a net zero um, uh, uh, um, planet. So at the moment, emissions, we still keep pumping CO2 out every year. When you look at the other parts of the, the kind of um, um, climate agenda, and though within Europe, um, uh, they are being progressive as well, but it really is the focus on the electricity sector. Hello, hello everyone. Uh, this is uh, the Tejun David Lee uh, from KDI, the Korea Development Institute, the School of Public Policy and Management. Uh, I will be the host of today's interview, so organized by Korea, the Energy Information Culture Agency, uh, also known as uh, KIA. Uh, countries around the world are, are facing and racing towards you know, their carbon neutrality goals, uh, developing uh, relevant policies and uh, the passing the targets at the interlow. Uh, in this regard, and Kia has prepared for interviews the, with overseas experts uh, to discuss the how uh, world is trying to achieve the carbon neutrality uh, and the present the status of the Republic of Korea. Uh, last March, uh, Ember, uh, independent energy think tank, uh, published a report uh, called Global Electricity Review 20. 22, uh, which provides the most up-to-date the overview of the changes and transformation uh, in the global uh, electricity transitions in 2021, 2021. Uh, for this interview, uh, the KIA has invited Mr. David Jones, uh, who is global uh, program lead at EMBA, uh, and uh, who is also the lead authors of the report uh, to learn about uh, how the world electricity, the sector, uh, is working to achieve the carbon neutrality uh, and the steps to be taken by South Korea to achieve its carbon neutrality goal uh, following the international trends. Uh, Mr. Jones, uh, thank you for uh, joining us today. Hi, uh, thanks for having us here. Okay, uh, could you first introduce us about the Global Electricity Review 20? Uh, 22. Uh, could you tell us uh, the more about the overview and its uh, highlighted points and the findings and implications? Yeah, sure. Um, it's the third year we um, we've done this in a row, and what we what we wanted to do and what we what we've been doing is is uh, trying to track the the global electricity transition, um, trying to piece together some of the data behind that. Um, so this. Global Electricity Review was um, getting up-to-date data for 2020 to the end of 2021 for 75 countries. Um, it contributes around about 93% of the world's electricity uh, production. The way that, um, that, that we see those targets is, is that uh, we're trying to track them against a one and a half degree pathway. Um, the best, or most famous, I guess, one and a half degree pathway out there is that relates to electricity is from the International Energy Agency that show that globally we need to move to 100% of our electricity coming from clean sources um, by 2040. And for developed countries, 100% um, of our uh, electricity come from clean sources by 2035. So we went through, we got these countries, we started analysing them. Um, the key findings that we had were that for the first time, um, uh, a tenth of the, over a tenth of the world's electricity generation last year came from just wind and solar. And that total level of wind and solar generation has now doubled um, its level since 2015 when the Climate Paris um, uh, Agreement was signed. So for, um, and when we went through and we, 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 we looked at that wind and solar, there's now 50 countries that now get at least a tenth of their electricity from um, just wind and solar, and that includes the five biggest economies in the world. In terms of what that means in total, what we saw during 2021 was a, a, a big rebound in electricity demand because of um, the fall that happened in 2020. Um, and that, that rise in global electricity demand was about twice the, twice the, the, the kind of historic average level. It rose by about 
um, by about 5%. Um, some growth in clean electricity, especially in wind and solar, but not quite enough to then to meet that increase in electricity demand. So in total, we're still at a point where um, the power sector emissions globally uh, are rising and they set a new record in, in 2021. We're getting on the right way, um, just uh, just uh, lacking that, that speed of momentum that we need to really start shifting emissions within the power sector. Uh, the, let me uh, the, to turn to so other question and to discuss more about your perspective. Uh, according to the, the UN and the World uh, Meteorological the Organization, uh, critical global indicators of the climate crisis that broke records in 2000, uh, 2021, uh, how long do you think this trend will last? Uh, do you think the goal uh, global uh, society can uh, fix this problem? Uh, how are major uh, economies in Europe the reacting uh, to this trend? Um, it's gonna, we're gonna keep setting new records until we, uh, until we become a net zero um, uh, uh, um, planet. So at the moment, CO2 emissions, um, uh, uh, um, we still keep pumping CO2 out every year. So in answer to your question, how long are these gonna keep going on for? Uh, a, a long time, yeah. Can society fix these problems? Um, we, we, we can't fix the fact that the, we can't get around the fact that the world is heating up. So uh, we're still using fossil fuels today. We have no plan to stop using them tomorrow. We have a, in mind that we might stop using them by 2050, but we're not going to stop using them tomorrow. So can we fix it? No, we can't fix it. We know that we're in a, a world of rising temperatures. The question is how high, how high and how fast are they going to rise? Can we, can we keep temperatures to one and a half degrees? Um, uh, um, uh, you look at the level of ambition from governments at the moment and when the, um, the International Energy Agency and a, a couple of other studies that have come out that have tried to piece together the kind of the, the most optimistic um, announcements that have come out from governments across the world and you, you piece them together and, um, and it looks like if all, if all of those implemented, we can keep temperatures to about two degrees. Um, so we're, we're kind of halfway through that warming process, two degrees. Um, as we know from the IPCC report, there's a huge difference in the implications between one and a half degrees and two degrees, but even two degrees isn't assured because there's so many action, there's some really good promises that have come through so far that haven't, won't necessarily be, or we don't know yet is to be guaranteed to be follow up with the action to, to reach them. So really it's, it's, it's every, point one that, every point one of a degree matters. Um, one and a half degrees can be super hard. I'd love to think that we're going to keep it on temperatures under two, two degrees, but really there's a big envelope between one and a half degrees and two degrees that we've still got to work to, to keep emissions as low as possible. When you say about fixing that crisis, for, for me, um, the power sector is absolutely critical for that gap between one and a half and two degrees. When you look at most of the climate uh, models for that, uh, a large difference in those emissions come from how quickly the world can reduce uh, coal power emissions. So last year, um, coal power emissions were about just under 30% of global CO2 emissions, not from total coal, just from coal power. For me, really, if we want to fix that, fix that problem, of keeping uh, temperatures down to one and a half degrees, it's really trying to target to phase out coal power as quickly as possible. The last section was Europe doing about it. Um, uh, uh, Europe um, is not alone in having um, promise for one and a half to um, a pathway to one and a half degrees. So the whole of the G7 um, countries um, have basically committed to reduce emissions in line with a one and a half degree pathway. Probably in the last year or two is that realization is like to get to one and a half degrees, it's not just coal that you need to be targeting. There's some really big emissions um, in Europe from the from from gas power, like there is in like there is in Korea. Um, so for, for Europe, it's not just about phasing out coal, it's now also figuring out a way, well, way to, to phase out gas. Uh, the next question is very timely and very important to us. Uh, this question uh, is, uh, the, as the pandemic uh, restrictions are being released and due to a Russian inv invasion of the Ukraine, uh, the demands uh, for coal and the natural gas and oil uh, are skyrocketing. Uh, how do you think uh, this phenomenon will affect the world with regards to carbon neutrality and your pr prospect? 
A lot of the reason why that inflation in coal, gas and oil prices have happened is a country is scrabbling around um, as they try to replace Russia imports of coal, gas and oil because Russia is such a big exporter of coal, gas, oil. Um, certainly within Europe, the, um, the Europe is now trying to absorb as much LNG um, as possible. So it's importing gas um, from ships from other countries to be able to replace some of the Russian imports. Um, so it's got less of a reliance on gas, Russia gas pipeline. Um, but the same is true for coal, the same uh, the market, the same is true for the oil market. Demand maybe isn't, the demand rise maybe isn't as crazy as, uh, as people make out. So, for example, within the, the, the coal power sector, um, you've now like the, the year to date numbers so far this year, we've, um, China is actually using less coal. From a supply perspective, it's, um, it's digging up 10% more coal than it was this time last year, year to date, but it's actually using less of it um, because, um, uh, um, because uh, of clean electricity coming online, so a huge amount of wind and solar coming online, um, some nu uh, nuclear plants, some big hydro plants have come online, the hydro conditions are better than they were this time last year. You know, you know from my perspective, it's like surely out of this whole crisis wind and solar should be the actually electricity in total should be the most obvious winners coming out of this and within europe um it's really really impressive uh, reactions now where the governments are really trying to double down on the electric specifically on the electricity transition in the short medium term um, uh, we had a bit of research out last week, which, um, uh, which is analysing how different countries in Europe have upgraded their 2030 plans um, since before the crisis. Um, and um, half the countries of Europe have now upgraded the, the amount of renewables that they expect in the electricity mix by 2030. Um, and you've got some really, really impressive numbers out of there. So, for example, um, Austria is promising 100% electricity, but of its electricity to be from renewables by 2030. Um, Portugal, 100%. 100 um, uh, you've got uh, Netherlands, which is promising 95%. And when you look at the other parts of the, the kind of um, um, climate agenda within Europe, um, uh, they are being progressive as well, but it really is the focus on the electricity sector. It's the electricity sector, which have seen helped Europe to the biggest falls in emissions so far. And um, throughout this decade is now really realized that, um, that um, out of the whole of the economy, it's gonna be the electricity sector, which drives the biggest falls this decade as well. Okay, uh, three questions and made for the first part of the interview uh, are answered and well addressed. And it is time to the finish the, the uh, first part of the interview now uh, in the upcoming part two of the interview. So we are going to further discussions on the steps uh, that should be taken by Korean societies to achieve uh, carbon neutrality objective emissions and outcomes. Thank you.